When I was a kid, I knew I wanted to make things. I studied mechanical engineering and uh, soon discovered that when I worked as an engineer, what I loved most was the human side of products, why people love them or hate them or how they made them feel. And then I discovered that there was a field called product design that does exactly this. So I went back to school and switched gears and became a product designer. I worked on many products in my career and my focus has always been physical things that had some kind of digital component. Because for me, this is where I really saw human empathy taking place, that I could design things that actually had a conversation with the person using them. One of the most exciting projects I've had in my career has been the opportunity to de design a robot. I worked with a woman named Dr. Andrea Tamaz at the Georgia Tech Socially Intelligent Machines Lab, and I was part of the core team where I was responsible for the creative design aspects of a robot called Simon, which you see here. The purpose of Simon is to study how we might interact with machines in a really human and natural way. So just as I'm gesturing to you now, or I might look at someone in the eye, the robot can do the same thing. You can hand it objects, it's got cameras in its eyes and microphones, and it can also respond with human gestures. Here you see Simon looking coy or putting his attention to a flower or listening or being ashamed. Um, we'll watch a quick video and I'll show you how Simon can actually learn from a person. Here he's doing a sorting exercise to sort objects into different colored bins. So someone says, Simon, where does this go? When he says, I don't know, he does this gesture and he can record the color that the camera sees. When she says it goes in the green bin, he parses the sentence and pulls out the word green, and then he knows where it goes the next time. So now he's going to put it in the green bin. This is just one example of many, many, many tasks that the robot can be taught. The next robot that I worked on, again with the Social Intelligent Machines Lab, is Curry. Curry is a bit more sophisticated in terms of features and movement, as you can see here. But it's a similar platform in the sense that it's about human-robot interaction and the empathy between a person and a machine. In this next video from TEDx Peachtree, Dr. Tomaz is going to show how a gesture as simple as pointing that we take for granted can really increase communication. The robot doesn't have to say the thing that's 17 inches from the table. So now instead of a complicated object description, you can just point. Is this a flower pot? Yes, it is. And that was a much more reasonable way to ask that question. The most recent project that I've worked on with the Socially Intelligent Machines Lab now at UT Austin is Polly. So uh, Polly is a robot that can also be taught different tasks. But my bigger goal is to really abstract the features. So we don't need to have eyeballs and eyelids and necessarily limbs. But here, uh, the robot is essentially a box that's a camera on a stick, but I worked with the team to really design it as something in between a machine and a social entity. So the head is still very social, it can do similar things with gaze and attention. Um, I emphasized the field of vision, I also emphasized the ears so people know that they can talk to it. And it's been used in trials in the hospital settings so that the nurses can have the robot do fetch and deliver tasks while they spend more time in the rooms with the patients. I even worked with a fashion designer this time to develop a soft shell to give the robot a bit of a more human creature-y look. And um, here's an example of how well Polly was received. The nurses even wanted to take selfies with her. So I try to make everything I design that is appropriately a robot some kind of social interaction. And um, in this case, this is the Neato Bot Vac, but even something as simple as a vacuum cleaner can be a social entity. But I worked closely with the CEO and the engineers in the company to use light, sound, and motion to have the robot be as friendly and as possible and have a personality. Um, here you see I've broken down some of the main points of interaction, cleaning, cleaning to complete, it's docking now, and I really devised every aspect of the robot's gestures. So when it says hello, it sees a person, 
and it can actually back up and then go back and do its task. I even went so far as to work with a composer to translate some of these moments into very quick but human understandable sounds. So here's just a sample of a few of them. Um, this is how it sounds when it's at, about to go to work. And this is when cleaning is done. And this is if it recognizes a person with its laser, it says, oh, hello. And then there are negative sounds too, like if it's scared because it's trapped or it's about to run out of battery. And then it can also just kind of go to sleep and say goodbye. So I'm continuing to work on how we can make everyday objects imbued with robotics. This next project is from my studio and it's a clever coat rack. So it's connected to the internet. Uh, when a person approaches it, it will wake up to greet them and then it lets them know what the current temperature is outside, as well as the upcoming weather and conditions. So the person knows what to bring with them when they go out. And I'm starting to envision lots of other products that are going to have robotics in them. A lamp that might nag you to wake you up in the morning. A bathroom mirror that will know your health stats and keep you up to date on how to be better. A bicycle that might help you with the next appointment and give you directions or a pen that remembers your emails and sends them out to the necessary people. A door that greets you when you come home. Maybe even a sous chef in the kitchen. I would like that. So what we know is that the robots are here. And it's up to us then to know our limits, whether we want them in our lives or not. For example, your washing machine is going to be kind of a robot. And to tell you the truth, I don't have any problem with it doing the wash for me. The elevator's kind of a robot, and my doctor might tell me, eh, you might want to take the stairs. And it's going to get a lot tougher. There is more than one startup working on something like this, a dog walking robot. Or how about this, a nanny robot. There is a startup working on this as well. So, it's going to get tough. So what we have to remember is that rather than trying to replace ourselves, what we can do is we can enhance the human relationships using technology and robotics. So in the next couple of projects, I'm going to show you some work that I've done with my students uh, at UPenn in a course called Smart Objects. One of the students worked on a plant that helps people in long distance relationships. So two people have these connected plants and the plants are able to know when they're being watered and broadcast that information to someone halfway across the world. So in this video, we see that when one plant is watered, the other person is aware that that plant's getting taken care of. So it becomes kind of a joint nurturing system. In this next project, we see something called a swear jar, which is a way that people can agree to avoid saying certain words that they don't want to say in front of each other. So um, I'll let the video explain it. It's by two students named Elon Kitterman and John Johnston from my Smart Objects course at UPenn. Thirty, 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 thirty. 
So there you have it. It points in the direction of the offending person, pops out the cork, and taunts them with the word that they said. So there you have it. The robots are here. We can have them taunt us. We can have them coach us. We can have them nag us. We can have them encourage us to be better. But it's up to us to know our limits. Thank you. Thank you.